All right, please open up your Bibles to Genesis 12, verse 1. In your key Bibles, it's really easy because it's on page 8. Page 8, Genesis 12, verse 1. Um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, all that Advent, are really about, a lot of ways, about family. And I've been looking into family history. Uh, years ago, we had a distant relation who put together a family history book of sorts, and it was like one of those 1970s spiral-bound things that we paid far too much money for in 1977. Um, but we found out through that and through subsequent research that I am descended, and our family is descended from this guy named Edward Wilson. He is my fifth great-grandfather. And in a lot of ways, we know a lot about him. Uh, he was most likely from Scotland. We haven't really been able to pin this down, but he might have been from Ireland, but he most likely was from Scotland. Uh, when he came to the, uh, to the country in the early 1760s, he was young. He was around 20. Uh, he eventually moved to an, in this little unincorporated community. It's still an unincorporated community called the Hawfields, which I think is really cool. Uh, it's in Alamance County, North Carolina. <laughs> And in 1764, uh, he married a young lady named Rachel. We don't know her last name, and they had a family, and they did pretty well. Um, he owned his own land. He had a nice spread of about 500 acres, which was, I guess, a lot. And uh, he became a tobacco farmer, and a, he raised livestock, livestock. He owned a sawmill, which probably in that part of the country was one of the only sawmills. And uh, he also owned a wagon manufacturing business by the time he died, which I think is really cool. Um, he lived from about 1740, maybe 1742, to 1812, 1813. We're a little fuzzy on the beginning and the ending. The trouble is, is we know a lot about him, and we can estimate things about him, but we don't really know him. I mean, like, where did he actually come from? Why did he come here? How did he meet Rachel? Why did she put up with him? Um, you know, who was this guy? And in many, many ways, on the face of it, we're looking for some pretty simple questions here, but underneath it all, there's deeper questions. And the deeper questions that I'm asking is, you know, not who is he, but who am I? And where do I come from? And how do I fit into all this? Um, if you want to know Jesus, at some level we have to ask those questions about him too. Who was he? Where did he come from? How did he get to this birthplace in Bethlehem? And I'm not talking about the big theological answers. I'm talking about, you know, God in the flesh and came from heaven and born of a virgin and all that. Those are all true. But I'm talking about something else. Um, we get to know somebody. We get to know ourselves by looking at where they have come from. Their deep past. Their deep family. So this Advent, this Christmas season, we're going to be looking at Jesus' family tree. So, and we're going to start, we could start with Adam, I know, but there's only like four weeks in Advent, <laughs> so we can't do like 67 relatives of Jesus. Uh, we're going to go back to the ancestor, Abraham. Abraham, uh, let's read uh, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 8, I believe. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household, the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed for you. Verse 4, so Abraham went. Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot all the possessions they had accumulated in the land, the people that they had, excuse me, the people that they can't take the land, the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. And Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah and Shechem. And at the time, the Canaanites were in the land. So the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. Uh, who was this guy? Abraham or Abram or Abraham. The name got changed later. That's another sermon. 
Uh, he was sort of extraordinary. Uh, he had a great deal of wealth, and we know this because of the scripture this morning. He was bringing his wife and his nephew and, quote, all the people that they had acquired. Now, I know that that means something we're very, very unused to in this era, and that is he had slaves or he had indentured servants at some level. This was a common practice in the culture, but that also is another sermon. Uh, in the Bronze Age, which is when Abraham and Sarai lived, you only had servants like that if you were very, very wealthy. In fact, God's promise was to make him and his family even wealthier, to give Abraham and his descendants all the land of Canaan, thousands and thousands of square miles in the middle of numerous lucrative trade routes. So that's a pretty big deal. I mean, how would you feel if you, I don't know, owned, anyway, y'all get what I'm saying. So Genesis 13, 2, uh, Abraham's wealth has increased. This is what it says. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. However, with wealth came trusting in that wealth and a desire to control that wealth. Now, all too often, the wealth controls us rather than the other way around. And later in Genesis 12, Abraham was afraid of losing control of his wealth and even his life. And as he entered Egypt, it was this complicated lie that he wove out of fear uh, of losing all that he had. That also is another sermon. Now, uh, Abraham also had the experience that comes with years. Today's scripture, he was, uh, says that he was 75 years old when his adventures began. Now, those of you in the room who were 75 or older, uh, how many of you would trust the Lord and go out on a new adventure? <laughs> Uh, I'm 45, and if you pay attention to Facebook recently, I can't even keep up with what my kids do, so I can't imagine even being 45 and called out to something that was so new. But still the Lord lives, and these callings that shake our heart and shake our faith still happen. So, with all those years, and with all that faith that Abraham had demonstrated, he came to trust, however, in the experience of those years. He trusted in the experience of his years rather than the wisdom of eternity, the wisdom of the Lord, who is, and I sometimes have to remind people of this, that the Lord is far older than all of us, and he is far cleverer than all of us or ever could be. And Abraham, though, did not always trust the Lord. His example was with uh, Hagar in Genesis 16 is an example. And that's how we are many times. Too often we trust in wealth and experience, and the need to control, and even cynicism. These do not come from the Holy Spirit. Our world is far too full of control and cynicism. Wealth and experience can be extraordinary, but control and cynicism, dare I add fear, are all too common and ordinary and quite frankly, boring. So what made the difference? I mean, this guy was really extraordinary, but he was also kind of ordinary. What made the difference in his life? What made the difference in Abraham's life was faith. I mean, he could have been just some ordinary Bedouin out there in the middle of who knows where. And faith made the difference between that and him fathering an entire nation called the faith. Very simply, faith made the difference. Now, what does that faith look like? I mean, oftentimes we hear um, you know, you got to have faith and things like that. It's, it's a vague notion. It's a vague appeal to self-confidence or self-trust and believe in yourself and all this other jazz. This is true, okay? You have to have some level of self-confidence and some level of self-trust. I even heard the phrase one time, belief is power from some humanist philosopher. And I, all that is true, but this is not the kind of faith that we're talking about. We're talking about faith in the Lord. The other kind of faith is faith in the flesh, and we just don't want that if it's of the flesh. You can't have the faith in the flesh because the flesh rots. This is faith in the Lord. It's very specific, and it has a focus, and it has a destiny. The focus of faith on the Lord, who he is, what he says, and what he does. In other words, trusting in God's promises, and that's what Abraham did. He didn't do it perfectly, but in a world of cynicism and control, his faith was extraordinary. And Hebrews 11, 8 says this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing 
where he was going. Think about that for a minute. Not knowing where he was going. How many of you would do that? I'm not sure I would do that. You know, back in the 1990s, some of you may remember this, there were these things called maps. Okay? And they were basically, you don't know what that is, they were basically big drawings. Maps weren't always on screens, okay? They were these big, big, huge drawings of the roads of a certain area. And they were there to help you find out where you were going. And there were these people that could read maps, and there were these other people that couldn't. And unfortunately, the people who could read the maps were usually driving. But this is also another sermon. Um, I actually found a real, actual map in my car the other day when I was cleaning it out. Anyway, Abraham didn't have a map. And he didn't have an iPhone. And he didn't have an iPad. He didn't have any of that stuff. He was not knowing where he was going. That was faith. But this faith was tested. This is not some kind of powder puffy, lovey dovey kind of thing. Abraham's faith would be tested. <coughs> Hebrews 11, 17 says this, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, mm, grizzly. And he who received the promises offered up his only begotten son. He didn't know where he was going. Where he was going was going to the point where he was offering up his only son as a sacrifice. I don't know if you're paying attention. Maybe we're too familiar with the story. But this is intense. This is very intense. I get antsy about spending a couple of hundred bucks, let alone offering up my family. The good news is, and the Lord eventually demonstrated this, Abraham, is what he wants is our faith. He wants our hearts. It sounds, doesn't sound like much, but it's all he ever asked for. And it may take us far too much time, but I pray eventually that all of us and all of them here will give all of our hearts to the Lord. How many of you had a poster of David Cassidy in your room at some point? And there's, yeah, I know. Yeah. David Cassidy, the teen heartthrob of the 1970s, uttered his last words and died on November 21st, just a few days ago. What were those words? According to his daughter, David Cassidy's last words were, so much wasted time. Let's live so that the time we have left is not wasted. That the time we have left never leads us to utter those words. We're laying there and we say, yep, fill it up. This Christmas, let's give our hearts to the Lord anew with faith. We nearly certainly won't face the trials that Abraham faced. Let's give our hearts to the Lord this Christmas anew. And there's one more thing, because there always is. Because of the faith, Abraham had the Holy Spirit. And we usually don't think of Abraham or many of the Old Testament guys in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. We get this strange idea, mainly because of 250 odd years of really bad preaching, that we think that the Holy Spirit is a New Testament phenomenon. It is not. It has always been there. And Paul wrote this in his letter to the Galatians. God redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's Galatians 3.14. We're redeemed so that by faith we might receive the Holy Spirit, the power, person, <coughs> heart of the living God inside our hearts through faith. Why? Paul says this about hope. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given us. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit is not just with us for our own blessing but so that, like Abraham, we might bless the world with hope, with character, with perseverance, and with love. How can we share the love of God if we have never 
had it poured into our hearts. We can't. We can only counterfeit it and smile and need it. And we might fake it for a while, but unless God is living in our hearts, what's really in there will leak out. The family tree of Jesus is this really weird bunch of folks. We're not going to look at all of them. We're going to look at Abraham, we're going to look at David, we're going to look at Mary, and one other that I'll keep secret. But the family tree of Jesus is this extraordinary, ordinary, very human group of people. What makes the difference in their lives is their faith and consequently the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Abraham to go out on a great journey of faith. The Holy Spirit affects every moment of our life. Faith and the Holy Spirit make the difference. The Holy Spirit can do all of this for you. And when you let the Holy Spirit act in your life, you draw closer to God, and then something very strange happens. You start yourself to take on the family likeness of God. This is not meant that you'll be called by God to move and do something like Abraham did. This doesn't mean that you're going to get sucked into something and your new name is Leonard or some culty thing. That is not what it means. It means that you will look more and more like Jesus because His Spirit is within you. Now, how is this relevant to our lives? Because these truths answer those original questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? How did I get here? And then next, where are we going? Ultimately, you and I are fallen children of God. We're in need of the blessings of heaven. We're in need of redemption. And God gives them all. What's the difference? The difference is real faith in the Lord and the presence of the Holy Spirit that can change the extraordinary according to the world into the extraordinary according to heaven and the ordinary according to the world into something much more profound and purge it all away and filled with more of the extraordinary resources of heaven. Turning our greatest flaws and our littlest gifts to redeem the world. Now, if you would like to connect with this all-powerful God, prepare your hearts now for Holy Communion.